Good morning, you're welcome to Bible study. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We are in Houston, Texas. And we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly. It's exciting to know the Lord. If you're sensitive in the spirit, you'll know that God is up to something good. He's God for you. Amen and amen. We've been studying the uh, Bible. We study here at, I believe, Bible Fellowship, verse by verse. Because we believe no one buys a book jumps about the chapters, the paragraphs, and the sentences in the book. You read from start to finish. That way you understand what you have read, and hopefully you understand the mind of the author as well. And since we've been studying scriptures, it's, it's been awesome to be able to um, gain a deeper insight and a better understanding of the mind of God as he requires of us. As believers, I'm particularly excited because my, my spirit is, is jumping. Praise God. There's something happening in the spirit. And uh, by the time we fully apprehend it, I don't know where we'll be. Hopefully, we'll still be able to walk on two feet. Praise God. Uh, we're in the book of Acts. Yesterday, we stopped at chapter 15. We're going to pick it up right from chapter 17. Um, I sat down yesterday with Jay. We were discussing uh, the pace at, at, at which we're moving. Um, it's a little slow for me, but it's it's uh, it's better for us to be thorough than to just rush over things. I anticipate that we'll finish the study of the New Testament somewhere around March next year. But I, I, I'm eager to get to the book of Revelation because some of the things in Revelation is beginning to unfold and for you to have um, clarity and understanding. But the Lord will lead and he will direct. Praise God. So open the Bibles, uh, Acts chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Amen. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. They troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken sec security of Jason, and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately went from sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. When the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. They that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. 
Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred within him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of, a strange, of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what, thou, what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone driven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he had raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysus an Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Praise God. You begin to see that things really haven't changed from Paul's time to our time now. Okay? See the very same patterns and the very same attitudes from people. Chapter 17 opens up with uh, Paul arriving in, in Greece, first to Thessalonica, and he found a synagogue of the Jews. The Bible says for three consecutive Sabbaths, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. He didn't try to explain anything based on human knowledge. He didn't try to ex explain anything based on his experiences. He didn't try to explain anything based on hearsay. He was speaking to them from a standpoint of knowledge. John said the things that we have seen, the things that we have heard, things that we have handled. Right, people tend to want to argue concerning the things of God, and if you don't know scriptures, they can confuse you. They can confuse you. Um, again, I, I, there's a testimony or there's a there's an example or story I'd like to I'd like to share, but it's not mine to share. If I can obtain permission to do so, I will. There are many people that have head knowledge of the scriptures. Head knowledge and heart knowledge are two separate things. 
And you need to know your word so that if indeed you're put in a situation where you have to defend your faith, you can do so intelligently and with knowledge of the word of God. Okay. Uh, he opened scriptures to them. He showed them the truth of how Christ must have suffered, must, must, must suffer, and must again rise from the dead. And he told them that this Jesus that I've been preaching to you about, he is the one that is the Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul, Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and chief of the women, quite a number of them. Christ is not his surname. Christ means the anointed mm -hmm. one. The anointed one, the beloved of the father. The Bible says he continued to dispute with them in the synagogue and with all the devout persons there and in the marketplaces where he met, where they met with him. You've got to go out and preach the gospel. You have to find opportunities to share the gospel. Jesus Christ said in the book of, I think it's Ezekiel, he said he will ask us of the blood of these people if we don't tell them. I think it's Ezekiel. Oh, let me check. If it's not, remind me to look for the scripture and share it with you. But if I tell you the Bible says, take it to the bank. The Bible does say. I don't say what the scripture does say. Uh, the Holy Spirit, if it's not for. If it's neither of the two, remind me to look for it and give it to you. Okay. 18.4 is a different scripture. I was thinking it was either 4 or 18. But it's there in the book of Ezekiel. I'll find it and post it on our, on our group chat. Right? Um, the Jews which believed not were moved with envy you will always find an antagonist especially if you're trying to discuss uh, scriptures where there are many people borrow wisdom from jesus and he needed to speak to the samaritan woman he isolated her he sent all the disciples how many men do you need to buy bread john chapter 4 how many men do you need to buy bread and how much bread are they going to buy for himself and 12 disciples, but he sent all 12 of, them, 12 of them away to go buy bread. Because if you want to be effective in ministering to people, it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. And that's exactly what he did. He was able to zero in on this, this situation with the wo woman, the, the, the things she had been through in life. Notice that the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge was operating in his life. He was able to tell her you've had five men and the sixth one you're with, you're shacking up with him as well. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge. So when we go out to minister, we're not just going because, well, no, we go knowing who we are, we go knowing what we carry, and we're looking for the opportunity to share with the person so that their soul can be saved. Right? Of course, the Jewish people that were trolling him um, showed up again, took some people and, and you know, caused an uproar in the city looking for, for Paul, but they couldn't find him. And so they seized uh, Jason, who was his host, dragged him to, to um, the elders of the, of the town, uh, lied on him outright, said they were preaching another king called Jesus. Uh, and they, they knew that if Rome heard that, Rome would get up. But we all know that that wasn't much what they were preaching. Right? They seized Jason, Jason and let the others go. And when the brothers saw that possibly be in danger by night, and they came to a place called Berea. Berea was, uh, had Christians that were diligent. The Bible says they came to the synagogue began to teach. Scripture says that Christians in Berea were more noble, verse 11, than those in Thessalonica. Why? They received the word with all readiness of mind. 
They were eager to learn. Not only that, they went back and searched the scriptures daily. Go to church, your pastor preaches, you don't go back and look over what it is that he said. Just swallow everything that he said from the pulpit, hook, line, and sinker. Who's an anointed man? An apostle bishop. It's not responsible for your soul. You are responsible for your soul. You go back and check. I've told you, if you see anything or you hear anything that I say that's not in the scriptures, challenge me. The day I teach anything that's not in the scriptures, leave this fellowship. It has to be the word, nothing else. That therein lies our power. Therein lies our deliverance. Therein lies our security. That's why we have to know the word. Right? The Bible says they went back daily and they searched the scriptures, whether those things are so. I told you yesterday, you listened to a teaching once, you cannot possibly retain everything listening once. You have to listen over and over and over and over again. And I'm still not satisfied with the indexing of the teachings. I know what I want. I just don't know how to express it. I know folks have volunteered. They're eager to do it, but I'm not sure how I want it to be. I don't know whether it's my own ignorance of computer stuff that's bothering me because when I'm searching for something, I don't find it. And every time I have to trouble Jay. If there's a way we can index it so that the scripture shows, the title shows, I don't care about my name. Put the name of the church. But let the title show and let the particular scripture show. Because people who don't know us or who don't know the name of the church or who don't know me won't stop. But if they see the title of the message or they see the particular scripture, then they will stop. All right? Go back and listen to the messages over and over and over again. The Bible says, therefore, when you see therefore, you go back to see what therefore is there for. On account of the word that is being preached and on account of their own diligence to daily search the scriptures to see if these things were so. Many of them believed. When they saw, they believed. Faith has to do with hearing. Believing has to do with seeing. All right, it was easy for them to believe when they went back and they searched the scriptures and they saw that the things that Paul was saying were indeed so. When the Jews of Thessalonica found out that Paul was preaching in Berea, they came there again to foment trouble. God deliver us from such people. There are some wives like that. You start your palaver, your husband leaves the bedroom, he comes to the, to the living room, you follow him, you're still running your mouth. He leaves the living room, he goes to sit down in the dining room, he follows him, he's still running your mouth. Young man, God deliver you from such a wife. They followed and trolled Paul everywhere that he went. They were jobless. Anyway, they had reason to send Paul away again, leaving Silas and Timotheus behind. Notice how it was Paul that was troubling them. They weren't really too concerned about the other men. They were also preaching the gospel. But there'd be some people that irk the devil and he marshals all kinds of challenges and troubles. And I tell people, when your life is troubled and you know you're living right, you're not living in sin and you're serving God the way you ought to serve God, Satan is contending something heavy that you're carrying. That's what's bothering him. That's why he will destabilize you and he will throw all kinds of obstacles your way. And until you learn to function under that stress, he will continue to hinder the call that's on your life. You must be able to function, problems and all. Look at Job. Going through everything he was going through, he said, I know my redeemer lives. Ten kids dead. Standing at 10 graves, not one year, five years apart or every other month, the same day. Grown kids. His confession was still the same. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the end, 
I will see him face to face. You must learn to play hurt. I remember when I was an athlete, all right? I played basketball, I played for Nigeria, I played in college. If you were hurt and there was no substitute for your position, they bound that wrist or ankle or knee, they bound it up and you went back on the court. You hobbled if you had to hobble, you hopped if you had to hop, but you played hurt. Mambi Pambi Christians, the little, the littlest of problems. God, why have you forsaken me? God. Suck it in. We all have challenges. We all have difficulties. There's not one of us that's immune. We must learn how to function and operate in spite of. When you're that tenacious and you're that stubborn, you will wear certain out and he will leave you alone. Very rarely bothers me as a person. He bothers my loved ones. And then that gets to me. I think they've given me up a hell. Got to learn to stay tough. All right. He sent Paul off. Athens. When he got there, he sent word back for Timothy and Silas to come back to him immediately. While he was waiting for them to come to him in Athens, the Bible says his spirit was stirred within him because he saw that the whole city was given to idolatry. If our society today does not vex you, then I don't, I don't understand. If the things you see on social media does not vex you, I don't understand. Jay, I'm going to send you a, a video. Some of you may have even seen it. At a point in time, I, I want you to... Uh, to split the uh, split the screen and play this. Let me let me forward it to you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'll send it to you on WhatsApp. some point in time, maybe after this chapter, I want you to split the screen and, and play it. All right. So the city, the, there are principalities and powers over cities. We've seen that in Ephesians 6. All right. Apart from the fact that it was visible, it was something that Paul could see. But I promise you, Paul could also sense in the heavenlies, uh, the, the heaviness over that city. And if you are sensitive in the spirit, when you travel, and you enter a new place, you, sh you should be able to pick up. I'm able to. You should be able to pick up what's going on in the atmosphere in that city. All right? So he went into the synagogue of the Jews, and he began to dispute with them. All right? The devout persons in the market daily with them, he met. That means that Whatever they were seeing in Athens was affecting their faith. That's why Paul would dispute with them. All right? That's why you have to be careful people you hang out with. You have to be careful people that you that you that you you know company with. The Bible tells us very clearly, evil company corrupts good manners. In the world, there's an adage that says, Show me your friends. And I'll tell you who you are. You see, birds of the same feather flock together. Let's go to the lounge. I'm not going. Let's go to the club. I am not going. Oh, no, it's just to have gone. I'm not having any drinks. If I want drinks, I have a drinks cabinet in my house. I'll pour myself a glass of wine and drink my wine by myself. I'm not going. Because in going is in seeing what I ought not to see. Come out from amongst them and be ye separate. God knows what he's saying when he gives us that command. You can say, oh, well, these people are young. They need to go out. Go out with Christians. And with all the money that Christians have, why don't we have Christian, wholesome Christian clubs where we can go? Why? And our kids have to go to, our young ones, not kids, our young ones have to go to those places and see what they ought want to see. 
I remember my birthday a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago. I told my son, I said, after we, we had dinner at one of the restaurants here in Houston, I said, after dinner, I want to go to the club. He looked at me like I had <laughs> grown an extra head. I said, yeah, I've never been inside the club. I want to see what's in there. I want to see what, what is the fascination. He said, Ma, you don't want to go to the club. I said, yes, I do. If only for 10 minutes, I, I want to go and see. He refused to take me. We should have wholesome places where we can go to, have drinks, have laughs, and, and dance, and, and do everything that young people want to do without the necessary, or, well, what I see from TV, without the crazy stuff that they do. Those things make it harder for you to walk right with God. It does. Why open the doors? And then start, start struggling when you're by yourself. Praise God forevermore. Certain philosophers of the Ep Epicureans, that's like an, an order or a group of uh, knowledgeable people who, the, the Athenians, the Greeks loved knowledge and they loved to debate issues and they would come up with theories and they would mix. They loved oratory, you know, gatherings where they would advance something and then defend it and, and they would argue, you know, intellectually back and forth. So they came to Paul, they called him a babbler because he was in their estimation, not educated. But Paul was highly educated by Gamaliel, who was a doctor of the law, All right? They called him a babbler. I said, what does he have to say? He's, he's, he's setting forth a, another doctrine about a strange God. People should thank God every morning that I am not God. Because I will, I will temporarily move your, your mouth to your cheek. <laughs> so that you know that I am God. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. All right. They took him and brought him to Areopagos. That was another group of people. Yeah, my Bible, my Bible says uh, the place is also called Mars Hill. It's like Hyde Park in the UK, where you can go and you can, you know, say what you want to say, and you cannot be arrested. You can you can speak against the crown, speak against the queen, say whatever you want to say, as long as you're in that spot in Hyde Park, it's a place for free speech. You cannot be arrested for what you said. So they brought him there and they, they wanted to hear what he had to say. So the Bible says, Paul stood in the midst of them and he said, I perceive that in all things you are superstitious. As I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Look at the wisdom of God. They worship everything. <laughs> and, then, and then they worship another God that in case there's a God that we don't know his or her name. Let's have a place for an unknown God. And look at the wisdom of God. Having set up that kind of a place, Paul had the perfect defense of the gospel I have ever seen. Those guys already believed in this unknown God. So he came and he proved to them that you don't know his name, but I know his name. And he told them the name of that unknown God is God Almighty, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with inscription to the unknown God. Let me then tell you that the person you are ignorantly worshipping, that's the person I'm preaching. Praise God. Oh, the manifold wisdom of God. He said, the God that made the world and all things that is in it, seeing that is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't dwell in temples. You built the temple. How can you build the temple for the one who created all of this? Even the wood and the and the and the slime and the pitch and the whatever and the cement that you used, he created it. Right? He said he's not worshipped with men's hands, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He dwells on the inside of us now. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't he's not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything from the men that he created. 
Praise God. He is the one who gave life and breath to all things and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. He had made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the earth, on the face of the earth. And he determined times before appointed and boundaries uh, and bounds of their habitation. Right? He, he talked to them about God and then he told them, he said, that's the God that you don't know. That's who I've been talking about since I came into um, Athens. Verse 30, he says, the times of your ignorance while you were worshiping this unknown God is past. Times of ignorance, God winked at. That's to say God overlooked. All right? Or well, now is commanding that all men everywhere repent. It's a command. That's why you cannot sit back and not tell people about your faith. You can only offend them one time. And it's okay. Your master is called the rock of offense. So if I offend somebody because I shared Jesus, I'm being scriptural. He has appointed a day. That's why, he has, that's why he's commanding everybody to repent. There's an appointed day that he's going to judge the world in righteousness. By that very self-seen man, Jesus Christ. And he, he gave assurance by raising him up from the dead. So that we know without any disputations that he will sit to judge the quick and the dead. The living and the dead. All right. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, as some will do today when you share your faith with them. Right? Others said, ah, I'm not ready. And I pray for you. Would you like to receive Christ into your life? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not ready. Okay. Who promised you tomorrow? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. It says when you hear his word, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation and as the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved. God kept showing them and showing them and showing them miracle after miracle. He gave them the pillar of cloud by day to shield them from the desert sun. He gave them the pillar of fire by night, not only to warm them, but to illuminate where they were. And it wasn't enough for the children of Israel. The Bible says their shoes did not wear out 40 years. And they refused to believe him. The Athenians were very, 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 very uh, superstitious. They believed in multiplicity of gods. And if you look at today, it's not very different from the society you and I are living in. The three, the three false gods that drove Israel into apostasy, northern Israel, Samaria, the ten northern kingdoms, and caused them to be totally an, 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 annihilated, that's the word, annihilated from the face of the earth. They call them the lost tribes of Israel. They've either been subsumed by other civilizations or they're all dead. Present day Israel is only the two southern kingdoms, sometimes referred to as Judah. The very same three main gods that they worship is what is troubling America today. It was Baal, idolatry, worship of false gods. All right. It was Ashtoreth. Which is of the order of Jezebel, Ishtar, or Diana. And that's the spirit that's in charge of sexual immorality and sexual sins. And then the third one was Moloch. And Moloch was worshipped by sacrificing children. Go into the Old Testament, you'll find it there. And for 50 years, we sacrificed children in this country. Portion is the consequence of your choice. Abortion is not the choice. 
people who are saying pro-life, pro-choice, it's not, no. The choice was sleeping with a man who was not prepared to be a husband and a father. You got pregnant and you went and you aborted it. Abortion stops the beating heart. By, I think if, if my biology, if I remember my biology right, by around, I think it's six weeks or something like that, a heart is already beating. I shared with the fellowship some time ago. It's been a while. I don't think it was, uh, I don't think it's the self same group that's here today. I wrote a, a poem many years ago, in 1993. I'm going to read it to you again. If you've, heard, if you've heard it before, hear it again. If you haven't, hear it. This wasn't part of what I planned, but listen, I wrote this as my project because I took some courses in TV production. I was just, I was, I was a housewife. I was a homemaker and I had a lot of time on my hands and I didn't want to be idle. I picked up the guitar, I picked up the bass, I picked up so many things. I took a course in TV production and this was what I wanted to produce, but I didn't finish it. Here I am engulfed in my world. The only things I've known are peace tranquility, and bliss. Here I am, minding my own business, living and growing as I'm supposed to do. Suddenly, I am stirred. Rudely, I am awakened. The chase begins. Or really, there is nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. The search is on. I try to escape, cringing, sliding, dodging, moving to the furthest end of these walls that confine me. I slither and slide, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I thought this was a haven. I thought this was a safe place. I thought it was your place to protect, nourish, and nurture me. The steel jaws of the forceps take hold of my foot, tugging, pulling, dragging me outward. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Ouch! What was that? The waters are cloudy. They turn to red. Is that my blood flowing freely from my veins? My heart is racing. I'm all confused. Ouch! What was that? I'm screaming, but I can't be heard. I'm crying, but you can't see my tears for the blood. When you cut up my flesh or crush my bones, when you puncture my skull, to extract my brain. Have you stopped to think? What pain? What pain? What excruciating pain? When the wiring sound of the suction tubes suck the very life out of me, when you silence my voice before it is heard, when you decide that I ought to not live, have you ever stopped to think? What pain? What pain? What excruciating pain. I am spirit with a soul, mind, emotions, will, intellect, living in a body just like yours. What happens to my spirit and my soul when my body you destroy? This is not the choice. This is the consequence. When you said yes, in parentheses, to go to bed, you made the choice. If I could be asked, if I could make a choice, what do you suppose my answer would be? Let me leave. Please, let me leave. God is able to forgive and cleanse. Don't be condemned by it. God gave it to me in a first person voice, speaking for that impact. It were better that you carry it to term and give it up for adoption. I don't know how I got off on that, but someone needed to hear it. God can forgive. The blood of Jesus cleanses from every sin. Every last sin. Now I know that those there are those that would argue from a medical standpoint 
if the choice is between the mother and the child, which way would you lean? Mother has three other children. Which way would you lean? That's a very difficult decision. And it's not something that I care to think about or comment. But I know that if I was put in a position to choose, I most certainly would not choose abortion. If I die, my husband is capable of marrying somebody else that will take care of the children. Life will not from my hand be terminated. Where was I? I was talking about those three gods that trouble America even till today. They sacrificed kids for 50 years. And like somebody said, 50 is the year of Jubilee. So God has freed America from the, from the horrific Go and Google the number of babies that were killed in 50 years. When you're a young man, you get a woman pregnant and you're not man enough to stand by her and stand by the child. God said, the blood of Abel, your brother, crieth. Blood cries. Questions? Any thoughts, any comments? Thank you, Lord. Chapter 18. Oh, uh, Rev, your hand is up. Go ahead. Unmute yourself. Jay, would you unmute her, please? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pastor Mo. I wanted to, uh, I, I'm in a different time zone and I thought I had missed everything when I woke up and all. So I didn't I didn't know I'm interrupting in the middle of your, your teaching. So I'm sorry. No, you didn't interrupt. I finished the chapter. Okay, okay. It was, it's great what I heard. And um, uh, I did hear, I caught the tail end, I think, when you were talking about sharing our faith. And one of the things that I learned uh, early on in my, in my walk with the Lord um, in studying evangelism was that if you don't share, if you're not happy about being saved, if it doesn't, if it's not a fire within you that you just want to tell everybody that you have a heart for people that you don't want to see people destroyed, then you have to question your own salvation because there should be a love in you for people that you don't want to see anybody, any, any opportunity that presents itself to share your faith, you should take advantage of it. And that when you can go days at a time uh, see people struggling or know people that have issues and you can open your mouth and speak a word to help them. We were taught that if you don't do that, if that love for humanity is not really in your heart and bubbling out, then you really have to question your own walk with the Lord. So I thought I came in on uh, you saying something about evangelist, evangelizing and how you take every opportunity to share. So I just want to piggyback on that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Safe travels. I'm here. I, I'm oh, actually, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Praise uh, I, God. 
I got in late last night. I'm at the truck stop. You see, I don't have my uh, seatbelt on. <laughs> oh, I got yeah. in, I got in late last night and um, I was just exhausted. So I'm going to take today and kind of take care of me. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. You're right out of the hill. I'll see you tomorrow. So I can't wait. And anybody else that's coming in, you know, I'm looking for you. I'm on a hunt for you. I know I know Jackie's in as well. She texted me last oh, night. But she she yeah. did make it in. Okay. Okay. I got to see her. Um, Sunday, Sunday is going to be lit. Uh, listen, I'm coming in the door with my tamarine and my streamers, and I'm going to be marching around, so get ready, get ready, get ready, as Mr. Jake said. <laughs> All right, I'm excited. Going to be some old school and new school in the house. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. All right, um, Trevor, your hand is up. There was another hand that was up. Trevor, go ahead. Are you able to unmute yourself? There we go. How are you, Pastor Mo? I'm awesome. I know I can feel your energy today. I love it. You're like bubbly and stuff. I love it. Um, so I have a question for you on <clears throat> Bible where uh, this is always a controversial topic. And I like don't even want to start it, but like we're going to get into it anyways on if the woman is raped and they're expected or like they're forced to um, or they get impregnated by someone that is a rapist or a killer or whatever. Now, um, I want to know or like if you have passages in the Bible that talk about you still have to give the child or not, even when it's not um, like a man or woman. I understand what you're saying about someone getting impregnated because they wanted to sleep with one another you should have the kid. Um, and all I know is from old teachings, because I'm still in um, the like Old Testament, where they talked about like, um, one of I can't remember his name right now, but he slept with another woman. And then they came in and killed all of them. They said that they had to get circumcised. And then they killed everyone um, mm -hmm. afterwards. I can't remember their names right now. Uh, but I read that story, but that wasn't God um, doing anything like so I didn't know if you had a passage or what you, like your viewpoint was or, or things like that. Like I told you, there are ethical and, and uh, difficult situations. Uh, for instance, a woman is raped um, and she gets pregnant as a, as a result of that. That's a difficult decision to make. I, I cannot speak for people. I can tell you what the word says, thou shalt not kill. Right. That's the word. If if it was me, based on my convictions, on the word of God, I will carry the pregnancy to town and give the child out. That's me. But there are there are ethical reasons uh, where why people will do one thing as against the other. You froze. Holy Spirit. Oh, there we go. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. I was saying <clears throat> a woman has three children already and she gets pregnant with the fourth one. And then there are health complications and it's like the choices between the woman and the child. There are complicated uh, situations like that where the decision would have to uh, come from the person in that situation. But I can speak for me. If I get raped and I get pregnant, I will carry the child to term. And give it up for adoption. But is there and anything that, in the Bible that talks about it? Like if a woman's not, raped not or, specifically, not specifically, no. but the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Right. And conception starts the moment the two zygotes fuse. Right. 
So morning after pill and all those kind of things, they, they, are, they are byproducts of the initial sin of sleeping with someone you're not married to. Right. Oh. Before I was again. The couple, oh, there you go. Even in a situation where the couple are, I want to try and switch my Wi-Fi. I hope I don't lose you. Because I have two two Wi-Fi's in here. One is one is better than the other. Can you all still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it was red before, now it's yellow. So okay, there we go. Now it looks better. Yeah. So um it's a difficult one. I right. I would I would say be led of the spirit of God. All right, but I can speak for myself. Right. Yeah. Because I know, I mean, obviously, if someone's already had a kid, it's it's different um, mentality because you've raised three or two or one prior where if it's a, a person, a woman that's never had a kid before in this situation, it's kind of a whole shit because it's a it's with someone that you didn't want to be with but also it's a child that's not a couple months or a day it's your rest of your life you know so um yeah i didn't know if there was a teaching um in the bible that talks about it specifically or if it's all because i know everyone has their own viewpoint of bring it to term and and all that but the right. bible doesn't say anything about about abortion okay well not abortion but like or I guess, yeah, I guess that would fall into abortion. Yeah, but, right. but the Bible does say thou shalt not kill. Right. And people can get into the argument of, okay, well, when is, when is it a person? It's a person from the moment that conception happens. It's just a matter of time for we to get to be an adult. Just like you're growing and you're adding minutes, days, months, years, that child is growing on the inside of the mother. Right. Mm -hmm. And at nine months, sometimes it's a little earlier, six, sometimes medicine is that good now, seven, eight, nine months, the child comes out and the child is viable. Truth be told, you don't know who is coming. Okay. That's the reason why I would keep the child, even, even if he was raped. That's what I would do. I can't speak for anybody else. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Chapter 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean, and from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, mm -hmm. teaching the word of God amongst them. And when Gallio was deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that, would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, 
Look ye to it, for I will be no judge on such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they designed him to tarry longer with them, he consented not. Bid them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. When he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. When he was disposed to pass into Achaia, brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Right, chapter 18 is about Paul's sojourn in Corinth. When you read First and Second Corinthians, you can refer to this chapter 18 in the book of Acts for you to uh, be able to piece scriptures. Paul says, uh, Bible says Paul left Athens, came to Corinth. He found some uh, a certain Jew, Aquila, and his wife Priscilla, right? Uh, because Claudius, the emperor of Rome at that time, I told all the Jews to leave Rome, and I guess everybody returned home. The Bible says in verse 3 that Paul was of the same craft with Aquila. They were tent makers. That was Paul's occupation. Pastors who say I'm full time and we depend solely on the church, I don't understand it. I honestly don't. Paul had a craft. And Paul, you'll find as we go on, Paul said, if I need anything, I don't need to ask you guys. I ask you because the, the, the reward of the given is going to abound towards you. That's why I ask you. All right. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to give someone some money and they said no. And I said, no, that's pride. That's pride. And that's you denying me the blessings of a harvest. And they said to me, wow, I never thought about it that way. Never saw it that way. Yeah, I sow. So I can reap, so I can sow again. So I can reap, so I can sow again. So I can give, so I can get. First time I taught that in one church in Nigeria, they were looking at me funny. I said, yes, that's, that's the reason why I give. I give so I can get. The Bible says give and you shall get. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Shall Jesus, is that what your Bible says? Shall men give to your bosom? I move around, walk around fully expecting men to give to my bosom because that's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Having fulfilled the first condition, give. Then it will be given to you. God will cause men to give to your bosom. God is looking for conduits. He's not looking for lakes. He's looking for rivers that are flowing. The blessing is going to terminate with you. Why should he give it to you? But if he knows that it's going to flow through you and through, through you, he can be a blessing to so many other people. He'll continue to use you as a pipe. And you cannot handle water without getting wet. You can't handle the blessings of God without you yourself being blessed. Not necessarily appropriating people's money. Because that's the reason why people don't want to give and people don't want to tithe. Because pastors have mishandled the finances of the church. We saw you when we start when you started. 
We saw the car you were driving. We saw the, the, the shoes on your feet. Allah, we saw that you are sitting on millions. How? What work did you do? You use the money of the ministry to publish your books. You sell the books and you keep the proceeds. You are a thief. If you want to publish books, publish the books with your own money. So that when you sell it, you keep the money. Don't publish books with the, the tithes and the offerings of people. And then you keep the money. Several ministers got into trouble with the Charities Commission in the UK about some, some 10 years ago. You have fiduciary responsibility over the funds of the people. And you use it for the work of the ministry. You don't use it to buy cars and buy luxurious homes. I don't care how much the title is. Praise God. Anyway, Paul had a job or something he was doing. The reason every uh, Sabbath in the synagogue persuaded the Jews and the Greeks, several of them believed, all right? Uh, when those who opposed him blasphemed, he shook his raiment, verse 6, and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean from henceforth I go unto the Gentiles. But that was the original call. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, I told him that I was going to send you to the Gentiles. But Paul kept trying to reach his own people. A prophet has no honor in his own house. That's why I honor my sister, Freddie. She's always on the call when she's not working and she sends her tithe diligently. I am so honored by that lady. It's a, it's, a, it's a joy to be her sister. Prophet has the honor in his own house. I have other siblings. Do you see them here? I have one in Houston. Do you see her here? Praise God. God had told him originally that his calling was to the Gentiles. And if you're not where God has called you to, you will struggle. And you will find multiple resistance. When he turned to the Gentiles and he began to preach the gen to the Gentiles, his ministry was smoother. All right. God came and, and reassured him because of all the head bumping that was going on with the Jews. Said, I'm with you. No man will be able to hurt you. I have much people in the city. And so he continued there in a, uh, for a space of a year and six months in Corinth. That's why when he was away from them, he wrote the letters, First and Second Corinthians, to them. Uh, <clears throat> they seized Paul. They brought him to the judgment seat. They wanted Gallio, the judge, to, to get involved. And he said to them, if it's, it's, if it's your religious matters, I'm not interested. If it's not a civic matter or a matter under the law, go and deal with it by yourself. So rather than for Paul to be hurt, the Greeks took the chief ruler of the synagogue and beat him instead. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn around for your good. All right, Paul stayed a good while <clears throat> working alongside Priscilla and Aquila. We came to Ephesus. That's how come we have the book of Ephesus, uh, the, the epistle to the Ephesians. Right? The Bible talks about a certain Jew called Apollos who was born in Alexandria, very eloquent, and he knew the scriptures. But all he knew was the baptism of John, which was the baptism of repentance. But all he knew was enough for him to preach the gospel. If you've been with me two months, you know enough to preach the gospel. Just Jesus Christ and him crucified. If they ask you anything about, about the Nephilim and the this and the that and the other, tell them I'm not concerned about that. I'm only concerned about your salvation. Are you saved? Let's leave the Nephilim. This is not about the Nephilim. Do you know Jesus? Your death was to close your eyes today. Where would you be? He preached what he knew. He 
stayed within the confines of his knowledge. And then he came in contact with Aquila and Priscilla and he took him aside and then taught him. Uh, uh, Bible says they expounded unto him the will of God more perfectly. All right. He continued to minister, mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing them by the scriptures that Jesus Christ, Jesus was Christ. And by this time, Paul had gone ahead to, to minister to the Gentiles. God is able to raise people up. And like I told you, it's a three-step process. The Bible says Paul preached, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Maybe you're the one God is going to use to sow the seed. And somebody else will come along and water the seed. And somebody else will come along and that person will give their hearts to the Lord. Sometimes God will let you do all three. Sometimes you'll be the one who waters. There's some seed in the person. And God will also allow you to bring the harvest home. But you must be a seed sower. Matthew chapter 4, a sower sows for a living. Must sow on a daily basis. It's as important as your job. That you wake up and you go to every day. All right. Any questions on chapter 18? No questions? Chapter 19? You want to go on or you want us to stop? All right, chapter 19. And it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. When divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. This continued by the space of two years, so that they all, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I joy you by Jesus whom Paul preached. There were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily drew the word of God and prevailed. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia, two of them that ministered unto him, 
Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a reason. At the same time, there arose no small stir about the way, about that way. A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they, they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this or our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with one hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? <laughs> Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men which are neither... Uh, robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen, which are with him, have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, they shall be determined in a lawful assembly. But we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. When he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Praise God. Paul left Apollos in Corinth and went into Ephesus. He found some disciples and he asked them if they had received the Holy Ghost. There be many of you that are born again and still have not received the Holy Spirit and still are not speaking in tongues. If you want the gift of the Holy Spirit and you want to speak in tongues, you can reach out to me, go through scriptures for you to be convinced and persuaded. I'll pray with you and the Lord will give you that gift. All right. He asked them and they said, we didn't even know that there was a Holy Ghost. They hadn't even heard about the Holy Spirit and they were already disciples. All right. So he asked them, Unto what were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. So all they had was John's baptism of repentance. Of which they repented of their sins. And they became saved. But they hadn't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Paul explained to them. That I told you when I was teaching on baptisms. There are four baptisms mentioned in the Bible. There's the baptism of repentance. Which is the baptism of John. That's for unbelievers. That's what brings about the repentance and the desire to be born again. And then there's the Christian baptism. You're already born again. You're already saved. But you haven't uh, undergone that outward expression of your faith, which is what baptism uh, for the Christian is. When you're immersed in the water, Romans chapter 6, you identify with the burial of Jesus Christ when you're pulled out of the water. They identify with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the same power that raised him from the dead is the same power that you come out of that water with. 
All right? I've experienced it to be true. I can testify. I remember when Bezel was baptized, the Holy Ghost came upon her. She couldn't even stand. It was an awesome experience. I remember when Nate Offer got baptized here, grown man. He was crying like a baby. So it's a separate and a distinct experience from the baptism of repentance, right? Baptism uh, before you're saved, baptism having been saved but not yet baptized, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the last one is the baptism of suffering. And Jesus was the one who went through the baptism of suffering. Although when I lost my child, I said to myself, if this is not baptism of suffering, I don't know what it is. So those are the four kinds of baptism in the Bible. If you're not baptized this weekend, you can be. All right. Uh, if you would, please go on the group chat that Jay... Uh, put together because she's receiving too many individual messages from too many people. All right. Um, go on that group chat and indicate that you want to be baptized. That way we can prepare your certificate of baptism. Um, so when Paul explained to them, the Bible says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came upon them, speaking tongues and the prophesying. Everyone that saying tongues ended with the apostles is wrong. All right. He went up to the synagogue for the space of three months. He spoke boldly to them, persuading them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And it's the same thing with you. Stay out of arguments and, and unreasonable discussions with people who want to. They want to point at everything else other than their own state. All right? The conversation is about your salvation. Forget what this person is saying. Forget what that person has said. Forget the experience of that person. Are you saved? If death was to close your eyes today, can you beat your chest and say you will appear before Christ? All right? Keep the conversation on track because they're crafty. They, they bring in all kinds of things. That's irrelevant to their soul. Right? Uh, he went to the synagogue. He spoke boldly. Some believed. Some believed not. Some spoke evil of the way. That is Christianity. Uh, some left. And when that palava was too much for Paul, he separated the disciples and he, he uh, borrowed the school of uh, a man by the name of Tyrannus where he continued for two years to teach and to strengthen and to establish people in the faith. The Bible says God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Hebrews 13, 8. He says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did that for Paul, he will do the same thing for you. He will do the same thing for me. There's no way in the Bible where it says only pastors should lay hands. Only bishops or apostles should lay hands. You should lay hands on the sick and the sick recover. Jesus Christ said, these signs shall accompany them that believe. If you are five years old and you believe and you understand, you can lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. That's the word of God. All right. Bible says, uh, handkerchiefs from his body. Aprons, any item of clothing from his body carried the anointing, such that when he put it on, on, uh, on, on the sick, the sick recovered. And I know this to be true, even outside of church setting. My my youngest sister, the baby in her family, she she was my dad's eye. My my dad couldn't eat. She couldn't drink water without putting some in her mouth when she was little. There's nothing he ate, he didn't give her a piece. Even when he's drinking his beer, he'll give her a sip. And whenever my dad would travel, she would fall seriously ill. He wouldn't be able to find out what it is. It wasn't malaria, it wasn't fever, it wasn't anything. She would just be running a temperature. Then one elderly uh, member of the family told my mom that whenever my dad travel, 
they should cover her with his shirt. Something he had worn that hadn't been laundered. Once they put my father's shirt on her, the fever breaks. So there must be something to it. And I know I've, I've shared that experience with people that have tried it and they've come back and said the same thing happened. As long as she could smell my father on the shirt, the fever would break and she'd be herself again. But here, under the anointing, we see the same thing happening. Everything you see the world copying is exactly that. It's a copy of the original thing. And it's unfortunate. Jesus said the children of this world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. It's sad. I was speaking on Sunday. I said they understand music more than us. This is the time. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Jay, this is the time to put that video on. Let's segue and watch this video. It's not going to let me put the video because it's on WhatsApp. There's no way you can save it onto photos? Yeah, but it won't let me do it from here for some reason. Uh, you want me to drop it in the... You can drop it there. You can go okay. back and see it. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna play it here. You can see and you can hear. Would have been better if if we could um, split the screen for you to watch it. Let me start it from the beginning. My music videos are making everyone gay, and obviously people can turn gay. Did you hear that? My music videos are making everyone gay, and obviously people can turn gay. My music videos is making people turn gay. This is a music video. Satanic rituals that you find in Hollywood. By the way, satanic rituals, they have uh, all the 
across the country or the world. So two parts. One is everyone sells their soul if they're not on the side of God. And the other one is not only do the other avenue is not only do these people sell their soul, they merge their soul uh, to the devil himself and participate in the satanic ritual. Of evil. We'll get the market on the charisma for you. What do you think, Mitch McConnell? Mitch? Thank you to uh, Satan for giving me inspiration. I'm going to play this one. Thank you to Satan for giving me inspiration to play this role. Guys, this is not a game. Christianity is not going to church, singing a few songs, jumping up and down, have somebody scream at you for 40 minutes with a message. Take your money and send you home. We are in a warfare. And when I keep talking about saying, has the money's over the top, I haven't even started. I'm way at the bottom. Because it's your soul I am concerned about. The devil understands more than the people of God because he crept into the church, he watered down doctrine, he watered down the word of the Lord, feel good stuff, Easy to get into offense. Pastor says something, I'm leaving that church. This is not a joke. Our adversary is real. Thanks be to God who causes us to try. All right. Verse 10, he continued by space of two years, teaching them and all that. God wrought special miracles by Paul's hands, and he can do the same thing with you. He can do the exact same thing with you. All right? He's not a respecter of persons, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As a matter of fact, as the clock of God is winding down, his glory is going to be more evident on the body. That's why I don't care if we're only five people in the church. I know it won't be, but I don't care if it's just five people who are committed and who want to live for God. Not lip service. Not up today, down tomorrow. Up today, down tomorrow. Up today, down tomorrow. No. In spite of everything that is thrown at us by life, we're soldiers. Go back and listen to the teaching on 2 Timothy chapter 2. Or is it 1 Timothy chapter 2 about the mental disposition? You're a soldier. You're a farmer. You're a student. You're you a vessel. Go and listen to it again. Anyway, because they saw all these things that God was doing through uh, Paul's hands, certain vagabond Jews who were exorcists, there's always a counterfeit of the real thing. Exorcism is the counterfeit of deliverance. That's why I keep telling you the fact that it's supernatural doesn't mean it's God. The two spiritual kingdoms, Colossians 1, 12 to 14. Both are powerful. Both are supernatural. One is God. The other is the devil. So they decided they were going to do what they saw Paul doing. They went and looked for a lunatic. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. Uh -huh. And the devil promptly told them, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? Some of you, your voice is not known in heaven. Because you don't pray. Some of you, you can't even, you can't even challenge the devil. Because you know there are skeletons in your closet. And so you play the taunt. Let me not trouble him so he doesn't trouble me. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? The man with the evil spirit jumped on them, beat the living daylights out of them. They left wounded and naked, ripped all their clothes. One man beat seven men. We need men in this ministry. When we start deliverance, we're going to need men. Nate, what are you guys doing? Kevance, what are you doing? 
Praise God forevermore. The Bible says, many that believed him and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which use curious arts. They brought their books together, burned them before all men. And the price was about 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. As a consequence of the purging and the cleansing, Bible says the word of the house and throw stuff out. I said it a few days ago. I'm saying it again. There are some things you have in your house that you think are harmless. Some artifacts that you bought when you went to Africa and they told you this and that and the other. Oh, this is cute. Listen, in deliverance, we've had people confess that they would make Costume jewelry, cast spells on it, and take it to the marketplace to sell. And you see a bangle, or you see a, a wristwatch, or something. Uh, people put on Versace. Versace is that his name? Have you seen the logo? What's on the logo of Versace? Somebody answer me. I Google the logo, there it is. Where do you go? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. We lost you for a second. I know. He gets angry when I start talking about him. <laughs> the Bible says he's the prince of the power of the air. So he's messing with my Wi-Fi. Jesus Christ is Lord in the heavens, on the earth, and underneath the earth. All right? That is Medusa the Gorgon in Greek mythology. We are not unaware of the craftiness and the devices of the devil. Somebody says Pastor Mo is too OTT. Thank you. I won't wear Versace. I will not. The Bible says, if it looks like it, it says, flee all appearance of evil. Here, yeah, look for that scripture for me. Put it up. Flee. Run away as if in terror. That's the dictionary definition of the word flee. My language is a proverb that says, I will not smell what I'm not about to eat. You're going to eat something, know how you will smell it. Did you put the scripture up for me? Many of them believed, they brought all the curious acts and all the books that were in their homes. They, burned, they brought them out and they burnt them. Jesus Christ said, the prince of this world cometh. He finds nothing in me. Put that scripture up too, please. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Sister Dawn. I see you put it up. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit to go back to Macedonia, then to Jerusalem, and then to Rome. All right. 
Again, Satan stirred up trouble for him with this man called Demetrius because he was making a lot of money because of uh, his, the designs he would bring to the craftsmen who fashioned stuff for Diana. Diana is the same God uh, called Ishtar. Uh, it's the same spirit, uh, Jezebel, as in charge of um, um, sexual immoral immorality and disease and whatnot, you know. Um, so because people were converting from idolatry to the one true living God, he was afraid that he was going to go out of business. So he got some people together and they came uh, and they, um, they came against Paul because they felt they were going to lose their, their, their livelihood. All right. It was so bad that the disciples did not allow Paul to go into the place where they were at because they were liable to kill him. When Alexandria decided to even uh, talk or appeal to them, for two hours they were shouting the name of this goddess. You tell the church to shout the name of Jesus for two hours. See how many people will do it. Children of this world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. It's an indictment. Until somebody came and appealed to them and told them, listen, this is a this is not a, a, this is not something to be fought over. We have laws in this in this uh, in this city. Take the matter before the law so, so that it can be um, adjudicated instead of all this uproar. Because uh, apparently he was afraid that if Rome heard that he wasn't ruling the place well, he might get into trouble with the authorities in Rome. So he told them to take the matter to the court. And he dismissed them uh, from that point on. Any questions? Busy. Hello. Hi, my dear Pastor Mo. How are you, Busy? I'm good. How are you? I'm well. I love your shirt. It's so cute. Thank you. It's actually a, I'm in a dress today. Rare, 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 rare find or a rare sight. It's beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. So my question, okay, I wrote it down. It's two questions, right? Um, so the first question is about Starbucks. You know how Starbucks has the logo of like the siren? Um, what do you think about that? What do you think? Should we not uh, biblically or, you know, in the spirit, should we not drink, you know, uh, Starbucks or, you know, whatever the case is? What do you think? I'm, I'm not going to be legalistic by telling you you cannot drink Starbucks. Be led of the spirit of God. Okay. But for, for me, personally, from a financial standpoint, I ain't buying no cup of coffee for $8. And, and they put, they put the no. prices up, too. No. Mm -hmm. I can make my own coffee <laughs> for pennies on the dollar. Right. <laughs> I am not buying your... You know, I, I, I still drink uh, OG coffee. I like the coffee. All right. Without sugar? It comes ready. The latte, that's the one I drink. The latte comes ready. Oh, okay. For hot water. I travel with it everywhere I go. And when I'm in the airport, I go up to Starbucks, Starbucks and I ask for a cup of hot water. Hot water, yes. I just need hot water. I know, that's right. <laughs> I take the hot water. I open my sachet of coffee. I walk away from them. I open my sachet of coffee. I pour it inside. I drink my coffee. One sachet of, of uh, OG latte is, is like a dollar eighty cents or something like that. I'm not buying no coffee for eight dollars. And then while you're buying the coffee, you might see you might see a biscuit or you see mm -hmm. a, a muffin or this and that <laughs> and the other. And by the time you leave the place, you've spent thirteen dollars. No, I don't spend my money like that. That's so true. 
Okay, second question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Oh, um, so my second question is about the cross. Okay. So, um, uh, you know how, like, I think some people say the cross, when you have a, um, like a cross necklace, right. And you have Jesus on the cross, it's like, you shouldn't have it on because Jesus is not, you know, I guess like Jesus is on the right hand of, of the father. So why are we still putting Jesus on the cross? That's what a lot of people say. And, and then it, um, it's also said that if you have Jesus on the cross and you wear the necklace, that could be a spiritual open door for things in the spirit. So what do you think? Did you hear my African hiss? No. <laughs> Should I, I hiss one more time? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. Nonsense. I do wear a cross, although I don't wear a crucifix. It's not because Jesus is is, is uh, uh, not on the cross anymore, so I do. People make doctrines out of everything. It's legalism. Mm. I have a cross that I wear. It's a gift from my mom. So I would wear that and I, I, I'm attached to it because it came from my mom. It's like this ring I have on. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the third generation that's wearing it. So it's like mm. a, an heirloom now. And the cross she gave to me will probably become that because when I go, either my daughter or my granddaughter will have it. See, Christ is in my heart. He lives within me. So whether Amen. I put a crucifix on or I put a cross on is irrelevant. If I put a cross on, it will be to be to it will be to go and make trouble. That's me. Wait, wait, say that again. If I put the cross on, it will if I put the cross on, it will be to go and make trouble. Why? <laughs> because I'm a troublesome believer. I'll wear it to a place where somebody will say something and then I'll have the oh. talk to them. <laughs> Yes. Okay, I get it out. <laughs> no, but we're not we're not we're not bound by silly things like that. You know, it's a piece of jewelry. It doesn't it doesn't diminish or increase my faith in him. Yeah. You see what I'm yeah. And the only reason I will wear it. Um, and at one point, the first time I, I got delivered, the deliverance, uh, I didn't know this, the, 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 the deliverance minister, he told me that would be an open door and he told me I should take it off. And I was like, okay, well, I don't have, I want, I don't want to have an open door. So I had taken it off, but I always felt so bad because I always, you know, I represent uh, uh, Jesus of how I am towards people, but I also want people to see physically who I represent, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's a big deal to God. Um, thinking about it now, it's the Catholic Church that still uses the crucifix. Yeah. Okay. So if I if I am not used to wearing a crucifix, it's because I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Methodist. If oh, okay. I gave my life to the Lord and then I went to a Pentecostal church and I became radicalized for Jesus, damaged for life. <laughs> No, but on, on a serious note, it's the Catholics who who still use the crucifix. Okay, but you, it, you it's not it, it's not a big deal. It's like legalism. No, it's not a big deal. It's it's legalism. Okay. It's, hey, like, saying, it's like saying you didn't wash your hands before eating. <laughs> That's <lucky>, right. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. Sharina, you're welcome. Everybody, please welcome Sharina. Get on the chat and say, Sharina, welcome. I invited her this morning and she's here. God bless you. Well, hello. You. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We'd love for you to put your camera on so everybody can see you. <laughs> oh, okay, let's see if I can get this together. Let me ask that. I wasn't ready. I met Sharina about a month ago. Uh, she woke up. <laughs> She walked up to me. I don't know what she saw. She said for me to pray for her. And I prayed for her. And that was the beginning. I was talking to her yesterday. So, yes, I was first excited. 
about your your curls, your curl pattern. And then I had a situation and I was about to have a meltdown. And I remember she told me the way that her hair was like that because Jesus did it. So I knew somebody in the room knew Jesus. So when I had a moment, I called on her and said, can you just pray real quick? We moved to the side in the middle of a business meeting. Jesus came on in the room and then you invited me to church and then we connected ever since. So I appreciate you. Yeah. God bless you. She was asking about my hair. Thank you. I said, Jesus is my hairdresser. Yeah. There's nothing in it. Nothing. It's water every morning. <laughs> so yeah, Jesus is a great cosmetologist. Yeah. But I do have a question. Pastor, Pastor Mo, tell him the truth. What? Uh, <laughs> your ancestors. What about your yours? ancestors? What about yours? Mine? No, I'm talking to Jay. She's talking oh. about my ancestors. Y'all know they got in there somehow. Yeah. That's why we have varying shades of, 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 of uh, melanin. <laughs> I do have a question, Pastor Mo. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I heard you talking earlier about our heavenly language, and I'm getting to a place where I'm using it more often. But to my understanding, that gives you a direct connection to your father. Is that correct? That's very correct. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3. Can you give me that scripture one more time? First Corinthians chapter 14, okay. verse 2. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you. You too. All right. Bessie, is your hands still up or you're done? All right. I think that's from when she asked the question. If we don't have any more questions, we can bring our study to a close. God is faithful. I'm excited about this weekend. I can't wait to meet you all in person for the first time after many, many months, some of you years. Praise God. It's going to be great. My neighbors are going to wonder what happened. Because there's going to be a whole bunch of us here. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. I do have... I do have seven rooms available. And if uh, if you don't mind pairing with someone, that means 14 of you can have beds. And those who want uh, air beds that we can, you know, throw in the living room or whatever, just have fun. We'll go and buy some barbecue stuff and we'll barbecue some meat and, and just rejoice in God. I'm looking forward to it. Praise God. Father, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for the bond of unity that binds us together. Thank you for the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. We give you glory, honor, and praise. As we prepare for this weekend, oh God, we commit all of our preparations into your hands. We commit travel into your hands. We co commit um, accommodation, sleeping arrangements into your hands. We ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will perfect everything that concerns us, even according to your word. Thank you that on Sunday, we will rejoice, we will dance, your presence will be there to lift us up, to teach us, to establish us in the present truth. We give you glory and praise. We continue to thank you because that building is paid for in less than a year. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. See you all soon. There's a website. No, no, no. There's a there's a link on on Instagram. All right. There's a link on Instagram. Those of you who need a place to stay, you need to go on that link. I'm not dealing with anybody individually. Okay. You need to go to that link and and reserve a place for yourself to stay. All right.